Uh, I'm very thankful to all of you for the invitation here and also for the very warm hospitality. I'm thoroughly enjoying my stay and uh, uh, I am only sorry it will be uh, so short, but I have to go back to work. And uh, yeah, it, this has also to do with the fact that the weather is wonderful and the food is amazing, but it also has to do with the pleasant pleasantness of the company. So um, the topic, so today I just want to give you a very gentle introduction, so I will not give any technical details and I will try to outline a part of the historical development of this topic and a few of the key ideas. So what I want to talk about are Donaldson, Thomas, invariants. And so the first thing I have to say is how these names come into the picture and what the invariants are invariants of. So let me start by reminding you or uh, telling you if you weren't there that in the 80s uh, Donaldson who is essentially a differential geometer defined invariants for um, C infinity uh, for manifolds, so real for manifolds, and of course with uh, all the nice properties, uh, oriented, uh, compact, without boundary, uh, as integrals over moduli spaces of connections typically AS anti-self-dual connections. So based also on, uh, uh, related to previous work of Karen Uhlenbeck. So uh, these invariants were considered very interesting, so they were invariants under diffeomorphic. At the time people were still very wondering, uh, because uh, for the dimension six and higher in many cases, homeomorphism and diffeomorphism either are the same or if they are not we have a good understanding why they are not. But uh, in uh, four dimension there were many open questions and uh, people started studying these invariants which actually were very difficult to compute using the original definition. So there were a number of theses where people compute Donaldson invariants for various typically for elliptic Oh, and by the way, where would you find examples uh, typically, so uh, in particular, they are deformation invariant for compact complex, non-singular surfaces both algebraic and just holomorphic. And deformation invariance means that if you have a one parameter family of smooth surfaces, so a three, smooth threefold with a smooth proper map to a smooth curve, uh, then all the various fiber the surfaces have in an appropriate sense the same Donaldson invariance. So it, it is something which certainly uh, is an invariant of connected components of the moduli space. Now, of course, if you have an invariant which is defined for algebraic things, you would want to know is there an algebraic definition? And uh, of course, the first thing is that uh, spaces of connections are related uh, to uh, spaces of uh, uh, moduli spaces of stable sheaves or stable bundles to begin with and then stable sheaves as you compactify. So uh, it was proven and I don't want to give names because there are a series of names. So uh, if let, if you let S be say a smooth projective complex surface and uh, if you fix an ample divisor, uh, rank C1 and C2, 
Then you get uh, a moduli space of uh, stable sheaves with given invariants, which is contained in the moduli space of semi-stable sheaves. And uh, this is um, compact, uh, but uh, the one which behaves well is this. So this is the one we understand how it works. Of course, in some sense, everything behaves well for an appropriate definition, but this means this can be understood in terms of the formation theory. It is at least locally, in an appropriate sense, a fine moduli space. So, uh, in case where, first of all, there was no difference. So the stable ones were already compact. And the moduli space, which I will now denote just by M, uh, is non-singular of the expected dimension, and I will say in a moment when this is. Uh, so this we will see in a moment what this means. Uh, then Donaldson invariance can be computed as integrals over M. And in particular, the, in this case, the deformation invariance is a consequence of a standard principle of intersection theory, which is the conservation of number. That if you have uh, a enumerative problem which depends on a parameter, then it is continuous, and since the result has to be an integer, it has to be uh, well defined, the integer or sometimes rational in, for technical reasons, but. So uh, this uh, is something people used and uh, it helped uh, progress the theory and actually compute some Donaldson invariants. But what do I mean by expected dimension? So let here x be an arbitrary smooth projective variety and we always work over the complex numbers. Uh, it is not so important here, but it uh, will play maybe a role later. Uh, the point is, if you take any E a vector bundle on X, uh, you can consider what is the first order deformation of E. So it means uh, it, you extend it as a vector bundle on a first order deformation is an extension of E to X times spec C of T modulo T squared. And it is uh, a nice and uh, exercise once uh, you have uh, uh, defined, uh, um, more generally you can uh, define EN, an nth order deformation, as the same thing modulo uh, CT modulo t to the n plus 1 instead of the t to n plus 1 instead of 2. And it's a nice and a not too difficult exercise once you know Czech cohomology to show that uh, the set of uh, first order deformations up to isomorphism and here one has to explain what is an isomorphism. So this is an isomorphism which fixes the identification of the central fiber with E um, is H1 of X E dual tensor E. And uh, more given an EN, so a deformation to order N, it, uh, there is an obstruction to extending it uh, to n plus 1 order in H2 of the same. So here this is a really, uh, this is actually, for those who don't know, this is a very nice thing to compute. So locally, 
uh, the every bundle is trivial, so in particular every extension is just a product. And all you have to do is check the gluing and you just explicitly get cocycles. So this is a nice exercise in Czech cohomology. And uh, more generally, if uh, E is a coherent, for instance, let's say tor torsion-free sheaf, but it's not important, or indeed any coherent, uh, then same role is played, so you want something which will be the same if E is locally free. Uh, so this one, uh, the first that uh, this is the first order elements, so the points over CT mod T squared, this is called the tangent space, and uh, it's denoted of course by T at E to the moduli, and uh, sometimes it's actually denoted T1, uh, and uh, this one is called the obstruction space, or an obstruction space, and it is denoted T2. Note it, uh, we will see in a moment that uh, this, of course, is unique because it's the tangent space. Uh, it has an explicit definition. But this here, I just so know that there is an obstruction which is inside here. So this is the tangent space, and this is an obstruction space. We'll see in a moment that there can be others. And if it is torsion free, uh, then uh, what you get is that Ti is x i e, e, which is of course the same if E is locally free. And uh, what do I mean by expected dimension? Well, there is a very general fact about the formation theory, which I think comes out <laughs> first when uh, you use uh, uh, Kodaira, the Kodaira's uh, notion of the formation of uh, manifolds is the notion of Kuranishi family, so of local description of the moduli. So holomorphically, locally, uh, near the point E, M is described by uh, D2 equal the dimension of T2 equations in D1 equal dimension of T1 variables. This is a general fact of uh, moduli spaces uh, so long as I have uh, a tangent and obstruction, finite dimensional tangent obstruction spaces. So in particular the expected dimension now becomes kind of obvious, the expected dimension at E of M, well if you write a D2 equation in D minus 1 variables, you expect it to be D1 minus D2. And let me call it D. And a priori this depends on E. On the other hand, uh, what happens is that we are, remember, we are in the well-behaved case where stable is equal to semi-stable. So E stable implies E simple, which means that H0 of M D E, this is, uh, is this 0? This is, uh, if you want, this is the X0. Uh, C, sorry. C times the identity. It will be zero in a moment after I will have done something to it. And uh, uh, there is a version, so in this case you can apply Riemann Roch for, with cohomology. There is a version of Riemann Roch for X functors which tells me that, uh, so X Riemann Roch tells you that uh, if uh, that uh, the sum for i equals 0 to the dimension of x of uh, minus 1 to the i, the dimension of x i e e is a function of the churn classes of e 
and the churn classes of Tx. So in particular, it doesn't depend on a specific point, but it is constant because I fixed uh, the rank. Uh, if I fix the rank and the churn classes, it doesn't even depend on the polarization. So, it, uh, so for uh, this means that for x, a surface, uh, this number does, uh, tells you that uh, this is uh, uh, 1 minus d1 plus d2, so 1 minus d does not depend on the polarization, on uh, E. So it is a well-defined expected dimension, and there is a general result which comes in two versions. One is due, the first one is due to Li and Tian, and the second one is due to Kai Behrend and myself. It's now almost 20 years old, which says that if M is a proper uh, scheme or the Lin Manford stack, but this is not so relevant today, M is a proper um, scheme with, well, what is called an obstruction theory of dimension, of expected dimension D. But basically what it means uh, is uh, this fact, that you can compute the expected dimension, it's always the same at every point and it is D. Uh, then there, there is uh, M has a well-behaved, again in an appropriate sense, virtual class which somehow it's like you this you have this uh, local picture of uh, intersecting uh, in the one dimensional space and if you could do it globally you could uh, move a little bit perturb the equation and get something of dimension d and uh, this plays the same role so, which is just uh, the fundamental, the usual homology fundamental class, or if you want, this is inside H to D M. You can view it in the Chow group, or you can view it in so homology. Yes. Theory of with theory of yes. So, the point is, that this class, if one wants to be precise, depends on the choice of the obstruction theory. Uh, I will, s yes, sorry, what was the question? No, you said something very quickly about that. I said that, uh, that uh, we will say something more about this, but the key way to, when you see a moduli space and you ask yourself, will this have an obstruction theory of expected dimension d for some d I like? The answer is you try to compute the tangent space and one obstruction space of your choice, one you are able to find. And if you can find them such that the difference is constant or constant in connected components, then most of the time you just take your original computation, you throw derived categories at it, which we will do in a minute, and uh, you get whatever is an obstruction theory. The point is defining it rigorously takes time and my focus is elsewhere today. But the key fact is I don't know of any example where people know tangent and obstruction and can't make up the obstruction theory. So typically this is what you look for and where you look for is uh, books in deformation theory where these are readily available pre-computed. So you don't have to do it. Okay, and then the idea was that, uh, in fact, uh, the original motivation, part of the original motivation of Li and Tian was exactly to define Donaldson invariance algebraically. So for an arbitrary as, as long, always a so proposition. Any reason to call it a virtual class? Sorry? Why are you calling it a virtual class? virtual fundamental class uh, because it's like the fundamental class but it's only virtual because it's what you are thinking about is that you are pretending to deform things 
around and this is the result. So if uh, this were the analogy comes, how do you do the same problem in symplectic geometry? Then, uh, or in, uh, in the holomorphic case, you are counting solu holomorphic solutions to something. So holomorphic solution means you want to uh, solve a partial differential equation. So what you do is you perturb the partial differential equation until the solution is non-singular of the expected dimension and you get, so you have a parameter space for the deformation and in the general point you get a well-defined class and then you make a limit. And this limit is virtual in that it's the limit of the intersection, is the intersection which you should have if it were. Uh, but why, so I, I don't know it better than this. I just know that it is the, the idea is you have an intersection which is not transversal and if you are willing to only get a homology class and not a homology cycle, you get something which behaves as if it were a transversal intersection. M could be of some dimension, but the obstruction theory could be of some other dimension. Well, the, the point is, remember that since you are describing it by D2 variables in D1 equation, this already tells you that the dimension at E of M has to be at least, so it's not completely free, so it's a lower bound. Uh, let me, uh, and the uh, proposition Litian is that you can compute Donaldson invariance as integral over virtual class in the, in this case. And uh, the, what to do when there are strictly semi-stable classes is something which has a long and torturous story culminating in a 200 something pages book. So uh, I'm not going to go there. So from now on, I'll stick to this case. And uh, if you see such a result, you stop. You think, okay, can, is there one case I can understand? And the answer is yes. How about I take a line bundle? For line bundle, I understand what the moduli space is. It's Picard. I don't even, the nice thing is for rank one, I don't even to put the stability condition. It's very comforting. So for Picard, line bundle, I get peak. So the tangent space, this becomes H1 of O, which we are happy with, but the obstruction space becomes H2 of O. And you wonder what, who ordered that? The Picard uh, group is non-singular. So uh, where the point of who ordered that is that uh, this obstruction space is an obstruction to a larger problem. Namely, it means that even if you, here I told you I just work always multiplying x by some uh, ct mod tn. But this abstraction applies equally well if I first fix an nth order deformation of x and then I try to extend the sheaf over there. And then already going to first order will go give you into trouble because the first turn class of a line bundle has to be of type 1,1. And when you, you know, do, I mean, this is this whole Hodge theory business, if H2 of O is non-zero, uh, the fact that your integer class, which doesn't change, stays of type 1,1, one, one, uh, you know, you have to check that this component is zero. If this component is zero, then it's a real class, so the H02 part will also be zero. So the point is, what I told you is this is N obstruction space, so in fact, if you, so this, the point is that in general there is a map, a so-called trace map from X to I, E, E. Which uh, in, in this particular case is really just a trace of the homomorphism. In general it's a more interesting map. And uh, this is sense the problem of finding tangent and obstruction for E to the tangent and obstruction for the determinant. The determinant is defined even for uh, 
The point is this works. So far I've never used that x is non-singular, but uh, the point is in order to define the determinant for a sheaf which is not necessarily locally free, I want that x is non-singular because then it has a finite resolution by locally freeze. So what I do is I can call x i0 the traceless extension, this kernel, and what I get is that uh, x to e e is another obstruction uh, space which is not the same, in fact it's in general smaller, which tells you that uh, the in fact expected dimension is larger. And uh, uh, x1 Yes, if I fix x then I have a bit of the obstruction space which is not doing anything. And so I want to kick it out of my problem. Is uh, the tangent to the space of uh, sheaves with fixed determinant. So often I will, uh, we will end up working with this. And uh, well, so then, uh, so you have this nice picture and uh, once you work, uh, sometimes you actually do work with this. In fact, uh, for uh, Donaldson theory, the case uh, where H2 of O is and is non-zero is uh, particularly significant and all kinds of things happen and I certainly don't want to go there. So how, when does Thomas come into the picture? So in the mid-90s, Thomas became a student of Donaldson and Donaldson told him, you know, there is ideas from physics that suggest you can do something similar with trefolds, at least with Calabi-Yau trefolds. At that point, the physicists were already very big. The string theorists were pretty big on Calabi-Yau trefolds. So, uh, trefolds x such that the canonical bundle is trivial and sometimes you put also the assumption that it's simply connected but today we will not. And uh, the point is they had in this case an explicit formulation which as usual in physics was a derivation. So a mixture of uh, properly defined things and things which you had a feeling for. I think the German, the English, the physicist word for feeling is ansatz. But whatever you do, you didn't have a even, I'm not saying a proof, but not even a workable definition. So Thomas uh, tried to use the original methods of Donaldson, which were incredibly analytic, and failed. And uh, so after, I think, one year of trying, since he, they only get three years of money, he decided this wasn't a good idea, or t Donaldson told him it wasn't a good idea, and he instead tried using the algebraic geometry way. And uh, so what happens is that uh, if uh, the dimension of x is equal to 3, in order to get here, you see, you get 1 minus d1 plus d2 minus uh, what you would call d3, so that what uh, makes your thing go wrong is you would want the dimension of x3 traceless or not, it doesn't make a difference because uh, the, the traceless part anyway, uh, the difference is a fixed thing which only depends on x, to be constant. And uh, Thomas came up with uh, two cases in which this was true. So one case was if uh, minus kx, so, well, Thomas said, well, it's a threefold. So this space is dual to um, hom e e tensor kx has constant dimension and then uh, Thomas came up with two cases in which this happened namely actually both cases are if minus kx is effective if it's effective and trivial 
then uh, this uh, is uh, one dimensional because it's just home EE and we have said E is stable so it's simple and if k is f minus k is effective uh, but not zero uh, then it's zero dimensional because you take a homomorphism here and you multiply by a section of minus kx and you get an endomorphism which vanishes somewhere and then it has to be zero. So this way he defined Donaldson Thomas invariants in this generality and again they are invariant under the formations. However, as you can uh, uh, immediately notice what is lacking here is examples. So first of all, typically, Sorry, yes, he then, he then he can apply the same theory and he gets uh, some numbers by integrating some cohomology classes. The point is, uh, first of all, you need to understand these moduli which, uh, remember, depends on the rank, churn classes and choice of polarization. And uh, secondly, he has to find a case where stable is equal to semi-stable, of which there are, but the point is finding example of moduli of sheaves on a threefold, which you can actually understand, isn't that easy. And anyway, the main interest of the physicist was in the case let me look a little bit more at the case the physicists were interested in, so the calabi yau case, which is uh, Kx is trivial. Well, in this case, uh, actually, not only you have the duality here, but you have that x1 ee dual is isomorphic to x2 ee and the same for traceless. So this is just said duality. So what this tells you is that the expected dimension is actually zero, which means normally to get a number you have a class of dimension algebraic dimension d, complex dimension 2d, and typically what you do is you multiply enough, enough churn classes to go down to a degree, to a zero dimensional class, and then you take the degree. But once this is true, this tells you that the expected dimension is always zero. So in this case, you don't need to integrate over anything. You just get a number, which is the degree. Hence, for any choice of so a polarization r determinant because you want uh, the symmetry so you don't want uh, the extra thing and so you want to fix the determinant otherwise you get something which is finite degree over picard and you're just computing the degree over the picard line bundle so in this case it's actually a zero cycle the virtual class is actually a zero cycle it's a virtual, it's a zero cycle because it's always a class of dimension d and in this case d is zero. So it's a zero cycle and uh, the only invariance you can get out of a zero cycle on a proper something is how many points it has. So we talk about expected Yes. It's always a d1 minus d2. It's always d1 minus d2. You don't really for higher x. Mm, let me go back to this question at the end. Uh, but in here... That's, I'm saying I want to go back there later, so let, let me not, in the moment all we can say is what happens when the D3 is out of the picture. So for every choice you get an integer or a rational number, but a number, uh, whether it's an integer or a rational number depends on precisely what structure you're putting, but uh, it doesn't really matter, but you get a number. Now, this would be very, very, make you very happy, except what do you do with, uh, where do you get some moduli space you can understand which, uh, where you are sure that stable, stable is equal to semi-stable. Well, let me go back to my original remark. This will certainly happen if the rank is one. Of course, if you say, ha ha, but rank one is just line bundle. Uh, but then what you can do is you can work with torsion-free sheaves. And so what you can do, 
for instance, it turns out that if you have uh, F uh, torsion free rank 1 sheep such that its uh, determinant is OX, well, it turns out that uh, this has a canonical identification with an IZ for Z in X, a closed subscheme of uh, dimension, well, a let of dimension uh, at most one. So, why? Because uh, uh, this is rank one, and uh, uh, that so this means basically it will be equal to its determinant generically, and what you have to prove is that this general map the closed embedding. So, it's something you sit down and prove. So, what you get, therefore, a nice modular space which at least has the property that stable is equal to semi-stable and it has also the more important property that you don't have to choose a polarization because something which has rank 1 cannot be strictly semi-stable, it's stable. And it cannot, it's stable no matter which polarization. Notice that uh, the issue I'm hiding under the carpet, namely what happens when you do wall crossing, isn't a small issue. It's something which is very much studied, although not yet very understood, in a very wide and general context. So it's not that I don't talk about it because it's not interesting, it's just because I'm ignorant and even the non this baby case I think is interesting enough. So what you can do basically what is, well if you have a subscheme of dimension at most one, this means that uh, you are working with a Hilbert scheme in X where P is a polynomial of uh, a degree at most one. So in other words, what happens while well, this polynomial has two variables, so for any P, you get a number, an integer which is kind of the virtual number of elements in that. So um, notice what does it mean P is if you have a polynomial of degree at most one, it means uh, you have uh, uh, two variables and these two variables you can view them as genus and degree in the obvious sense. I mean like pretend it's a smooth curve and then you can read off genus and degree from the Hilbert polynomial. It's just the coefficients. Uh, but notice that uh, this z needn't be purely one dimensional. So you, in particular it makes sense to say that the degree is zero. Of course to have a d you have to choose a, a divisor, but it doesn't matter which divisor you choose. I mean you will get, yes? No, z is not necessarily pure dimensional. Uh, there is actually a very nice example in Hartshorn where he shows that uh, where you study the, mod the Hilbert scheme of uh, cubics in uh, P3, of, uh, di sorry, the Hilbert scheme of P3, and you can see that uh, the plane, if you take uh, the, the twisted rational, the, the normal rational curve, and you go to the limit where you put it in the plane, you, you have an extra point sticking out, and then this extra point can go around. So you can have, in the same Hilbert scheme, curves which are pure dimensional and curves which are not. So that is a, you know, unfortunate property of the, well, unfortunate, just the way the Hilbert scheme is. So notice that not all the elements in this will be curves. Some of it will be curves and points. And in some cases, you will even have just points. You can just take zero dimensional. Uh, notice that, or if you want to be more precise, you can, instead of, uh, this is, uh, this D comes from fixing a hyperplane, so an ample class. But otherwise, you can fix uh, G and beta, and beta will be then uh, the um, uh, homology class. So uh, telling you what is it degree on 
on every ample divisor or so. I mean, I, I, there are several ways. All, that's all I'm saying. But let, let me stick with the simplest. So, of course, if you are a physicist uh, or if you are somebody who likes to uh, power series and so on, uh, the first thing you do when you see a number of integers which depend on two parameters is to make a power series out of that into variables and you get a nice power series. And then uh, when this happened, uh, the point is, uh, in some sense, what you are doing, apart from these strange points lying around, you are assuming that the dimension is zero, you are counting genus G degree D curves in uh, your uh, threefold, except uh, maybe you take a general deformation of the threefold or you just hope for best. So, of course, this is a problem people had studied for about a decade by that point, people being algebraic geometers and physicists, and there was a different way to compute curves inside Calabi-Yau threefolds, or in fact inside anything. Another way to compute a number of curves in, for instance, a threefold, but uh, in anything, in any smooth projective curve, are Gromov-Witten invariants. Uh, in any smooth projective variety. And uh, these are integrals <coughs> over a certain moduli stack, which will, I will not say what it is, but over a compactification of, say, the set of all C in X of uh, non-singular uh, given G and D. And here by compactification I mean that this will be open, not that it will be dense. This might even be empty. But it's one special case of what we are doing. And uh, here I have that the tangent on uh, such a point is H0 of C of the normal bundle and the obstruction is H1. And uh, what you can check it's a very is that uh, if uh, X is a Calabi-Yau threefold, uh, then uh, you have the usual uh, sequence and this implies that the determinant of NC is uh, minus the canonical class and you do a little bit of uh, duality and you get that by third duality you get again that uh, H0 of NC dual H1. So the expected dimension is again zero because the difference is zero. And therefore you get, well in this case the rational number then there are, KC, right? sorry? Minus of KC. Minus KC, yes, thank you so much. They get the rational number for every G and D. So here you have a power series and here you have a power series with the same variables. So, so the first thing to do is, uh, is then there a relationship and there, is, there are two papers that everybody remembers because it's in alphabetical order but in this special case I will write all the names because I remember the name of people I have actually talk to. So what they do is they uh, conjecture an explicit relation between the Donaldson-Thomas and the Gromov-Witten series and uh, here the relation is not an equivalence. 
So it tells you that Donaldson Thomas determines Gram of Witten, but not conversely. And uh, the difference is precisely what I was saying that in Donaldson Thomas you have a spare points running around. So you have to get rid of the contribution of the parts of the Hilbert scheme that only parameterize zero dimensional subscheme. So they have found a clever way to do that. I mean, you know, as, as, there's a physicist in the middle and a very brilliant one. So, and there's a number of uh, incredibly smart people all over. And uh, uh, so that this means that Donald and Thomas determines Rome of Witten, but not conversely. And uh, well, and then uh, you can uh, ask yourself, uh, I mean, why are they different? In some sense, here you see a kind of asymmetry that uh, Donaldson Thomas, in some sense, is better, is more information. So, yes? Is there only one possible map here? I, mean, can you say I think it, there is a canonical one. Of course, it's always unique up to scalar. That uh, is, uh, anyway. But the point is that uh, it's determined by identifying the determinant. So if you fix an isomorphism of the determinant with O, then it determines a unique map. Yes? So does this work out well for cases? Sorry? Does this work out well for cases? Well, for ca you see, for K3 surface, I didn't say that. But what happens with K3 surfaces is, of course, that this duality doesn't happen. The duality is that X1 is dual to itself. Uh, the X1 is dual to X1. And in fact, this is a very beautiful thing which has been studied by Mukai, who proved uh, that uh, the moduli spaces of uh, sh stable sheaves on a K3 surface are symplectic. Because in this case, this duality is given by the Yoneda pairing, which is Q-symmetric. So you get uh, this uh, isomorphism between uh, the tangent and the cotangent is Q-symmetric and gives you a symplectic structure. In fact, uh, I think as far as we know, basically all examples of irreducible symplectic manifolds appear as either moduli spaces of sheaves on K3s or moduli spaces of sheaves on abelian surfaces or rela some relation to these. So it is an important case, but it doesn't have this symmetry. So what is the difference? And the difference is, you see here, the duality between tangent and obstruction is true at every point. But in the Gromov-Witten case, this duality is only true at these special points. Well, you could ask, maybe it's still true, but then you go and do your computing. So here, I have proven not just that the dimension was zero. I've given an explicit canonical duality, a, an explicit isomorphism of the dual of the tangent with the obstruction at every point. And this is just their duality. So it's as canonical as you can get in algebraic geometry. Here, I also had the third duality, so this is also extremely canonical, but I only had it on the locus in the moduli parametrizing <coughs> smooth curves. Yes? And uh, I told you that here there was a compactification. So the compactification still has a tangent and obstruction, although they are slightly, basically what you do is uh, you, you have, uh, anyway, what you're doing is you, they become the x i of, uh, um, what, what you do is you dualize everything, so it's omega x uh, restricted to C to LC or C. So if you know what this is, uh, that's fine. If, if not, uh, forget it. But the point is this is no longer, so you can write them out, but they are no longer canonically dual to each other. That there is, so this property of having a, a third duality is lost on the boundary, or maybe everywhere in case this boundary is, uh, may contain, a, in general this boundary will contain actual components. So, 
So, what is happening is that on the Donaldson Thomas case, you have this extra symmetry which makes it more special. And uh, what you do, you, what you can do is you take, can take set duality and uh, write it in derived category language. Remember, derived categories are an abstract way to go do derived functors. X groups uh, are derived functors, so any the set duality can be rewritten in terms. So what happens is that uh, uh, there exists a perfect complex in minus one zero over uh, m. M is the well. Let, let me just uh, work with the Hilbert scheme over h one Hild p of x with the property that uh, at every point the uh, which computes tangent and obstruction so for some uh, yes so Say it again. Gram of Wheaton invariants are also integrals, integrals of over a compactification, a mod over a stack which contains, which is proper, and which contains this as open sub scheme. And of course, if one wants to write it, this is a special case, you have to generalize and then you have to write it all down and this takes uh, some hours. But uh, the idea is it's an integral of something, but s in this particular case, since the dimension is zero, and I have said it's always things which have a perfect obstruction theory, so if the expected dimension is zero even at one point, it will be zero everywhere, because I assume it's the same. So now I have a class of dimension zero, so I don't, if I want to make an integral, the only thing I can do is take its degree. Because as soon as I try to uh, integrate some uh, first term class, I will go to dimension minus one and I go to zero. I'm just confused that you're pointing at that and calling Thomas invariants. So what you're doing here is Sorry. Here, yes, but now I, uh, I am back to Donaldson Thomas. Okay. So what uh, this also applies to gromov witten but let me say it in the Donaldson-Thomas way. There is a complex such that for any point H, which remember corresponds to a Z, to a subscheme Z, then what you can do is you can take, uh, well, let, let me call it just Z, and what I can do, I can take E dot, restrict it to Z, dualize. So it was in degree minus one zero. When I, do, when I restrict it to Z, these are locally free sheaves. So when I restrict them locally free, when I restrict them, I have a complex here. Set of locally frees. When I restrict them to a point, uh, then I automatically get uh, that uh, mm, they become vector spaces. And then I dualize and I get a morphism of vector spaces in degree zero. Yeah, on X, there is a universal curve over H. And you're going to take the relative X. X. I'm to going to take the relative uh, X. To uh, yes. Essentially, essentially. <laughs> and uh, so what you have is that this guy here has H0 is equal to X1 traceless of IZ. IZ. And H1 is uh, X2 traceless of IZ. 
I see. So, this is uh, the derived uh, x, so it is uh, the x in the derived category. So, the way I would normally do it is I would take the universal curve and I would take a resolution of I z by very negative uh, um, sums of very, very negative line bundles and then I apply HOM uh, and then I take uh, if they are very negative, when I apply HOM, I get uh, IZ twisted with very positive line bundles. So, so, I can just take the push forward because the higher push forwards will be zero. So, that is uh, how you do it. And uh, so, what you do now is uh, you remark that, you, as I said, you have cell duality. And the set duality basically tells you that uh, gives you an isomorphism theta from E to E dual shifted by 1. Since I can never remember how the indices go, it means in the derived category of H. So I'm putting the dual on top so that I have still space here. So I have a theta 0 and a theta minus 1, which is a quasi-isomorphism. So in particular, notice that gives, uh, and this theta has the property that it is, you can uh, prove, and this is something I work on with Kalberend is that uh, this theta is uh, self-dual. So what does it mean that it's self-dual? You see, here you have a map from E0 to the dual of E minus 1. Uh, and this you have a map from E minus 1 to the dual of E0. So you can ask yourself, uh, uh, what is the relation between this map? And the answer is that theta 0 is theta minus 1 dual. So, in particular, what this means, so let me look at uh, uh, an explicit uh, geometric case uh, where I could get such a thing. So, how do I work out an example of such an object? So, the most simple way how to construct an example you can understand, which is uh, not these abstract Hilbert schemes, which are hard to compute, but something concrete where you can actually write down these bundles. So an, an example is you take y, n is smooth variety, and f, a locally free sheaf, and uh, you take uh, s, a section of f, and uh, you take uh, uh, M to be the zero locus of this section. Uh, then what you have, uh, if you want to decide uh, how this famous obstruction theory is, in this case, uh, this is just uh, the beginning of the, so you have uh, F dual goes to O Y, this is uh, the section S. And then you have uh, the differential, this goes to omega 1 y. This, of course, is not O y linear. It's just a Dirac differential. And what you get is that f restricted to m to omega 1 y restricted to m is an obstruction theory for m. So this is basically because you are, you are intersecting uh, uh, some zero locus of uh, section. So it's just uh, something you, you check. What uh, you see, if you have a point which is inside y and you try to move it away, uh, well, you move it away inside m, and how do you check whether it stays inside y? Well, you have to check whether the corresponding section goes away from zero. So it's uh, basically this is the key idea. Now, how do you get to do something like this? So, something which is self-dual. So, the first thing is, uh, well, you want to cha chase uh, to have, sorry, this is f-dual. You want f-dual to be omega 1 y dual. For instance, of course, it doesn't, 
All you need uh, is to have this condition on M, but uh, mm, why don't I just take it globally? And then I have this uh, symmetry condition. So this means that uh, this uh, my S, sorry, the F dual is the dual, omega 1y dual. So this means F is omega 1y. So my S is just omega, a one form. And then what happens when you write the symmetry condition, and there is a symmetry which I didn't quite write down, so your differential form will be sum of uh, fi dxi, and uh, the con necessary, the condition to have this uh, self-duality will be that, uh, I mean this, uh, remember here you are differentiating, so what you want is that dfi over dsj is symmetric. And what is a nice way to guarantee that uh, dfi over dsj is symmetric is, uh, this is certainly true if omega is closed. Because uh, then uh, locally it's exact uh, and then it's just pa mixed partials commute. So this is uh, kind of nice and uh, well you can ask yourself uh, is the converse true? So is it, so it's clear that if locally you can write it as the zero locus of uh, closed one form then at least locally you have uh, self-dual obstruction theory. By the way, while having an obstruction theory is not terribly informative about the variety, having a self-dual obstruction theory is a, a kind of non-trivial requirement. For instance, if you just take a nodal curve at the node, it doesn't have a self-dual obstruction theory. Just uh, to give you an example. So this is a non-trivial condition, even locally. And um, so the next question, well, we had no idea how to decide that. So one can ask oneself, maybe in some case, can we have, remember, I told you the physicist had ideas how to do this. And indeed, in the physics language, uh, what uh, they had was that the corresponding moduli space of connection was what they called the, the critical locus of a function. And the critical locus is the locus where the partial derivatives vanish, so the zero locus of the differential. So why didn't we just take the thing by the physicist? Well, it's because, of course, all of this is incredibly infinite dimensional. So it's a Banach many folds and uh, it's uh, whatever. It's, it's, where it's not this. Okay, so since you come up with this and you ask yourself, uh, does this closeness uh, ever happen? So, uh, well, you start looking in the literature for examples. And uh, since I am familiar with the Hilbert scheme of points, I started looking at Hilbert scheme of points, of zero dimensional subschemes, which have the advantage that the singularity doesn't depend on which Calabi-Yau threefold you get, for instance. In fact, it doesn't depend on anything, it only depends on the dimension. So if you take a smooth threefold, the Hilbert scheme of one, two, and three points are non-singular, and the Hilbert scheme of four points, and let me take C3 for instance, is a singular. So this has dimension 12, and uh, the singularity uh, locally is isomorphic to C3 times the cone over the Grassmannian of lines in P5. So let me tell you how this singularity is done. I hope you know this trick. If you take G15, there is a nice way to embed it in P14, which is as follows. You take uh, V and W in C6, the generators, and you map them to uh, V times transpose of W minus W times transpose of V. I tend to view my vectors as column vectors. So, so this is a skew symmetric 
6 by 6 matrix of rank 2. And if you change generators, you only change up to scalars. So when I say the cone over G15, what I mean is uh, that in the space uh, of uh, skew symmetric matrices, yes? It's uh, yeah, sorry, these are lines in P5 because I, I'm Italian, I'm sorry. And then I, of course, without telling anybody, anything to anybody, I went up one dimension and worked vector space like. Uh, so this, uh, the inside here, you have the uh, matrices of uh, rank at most two. And of course this is, uh, uh, this is a very nice thing and uh, I don't think I could have come up with it uh, but I am smart enough uh, to know how to find such examples. Let me ask my husband. <laughs> anyway, so what happens here, this is a, uh, as, uh, this is the zero locus of, it's a critical locus because if you take the Fafian, the Fafian, remember if you have a skew symmetric form matrix of even rank, then its determinant is a perfect square and it's a square of some, in this case, degree 3 function, this is a degree 3 polynomial, and uh, the zero locus of the Fafian is of course the locus of uh, uh, A which are not invertible, so of rank at most 4. And uh, the uh, zero locus of the differential of the Pfaffian is the singularities of the Pfaffian is equal to 0. And where are where is the locus of the matrix of rank at most for singular? It's singular exactly here, when the rank drops one more. So, uh, you see, this is uh, the way I tend to think of things. So I try to find one example and check that. And so based on this, uh, we kind of uh, thought that, um, I don't think we made a conjecture, but we thought it would be very nice if uh, every uh, every one of these spaces could be written in such a way, at least locally, but we I don't think we even went as far as conjecturing it. So what happened then is Pandaripand, so what we proved was something very easy and much more simple, namely that if you have this uh, self-duality, then you can always locally write it as zero locus of a one form, and this one form is only almost close. So the differential vanishes on the zero, sub -ske zero scheme of the form itself. So that uh, omega almost closed means that the differential of omega restricted to the zero locus of omega is zero. Of course, if omega has any kind of homogeneity property, this means it is actually closed. So if you have any graded structure, then you get it. It's closed in particular. This shows the results for the Hilbert scheme because for the Hilbert scheme uh, you can always uh, put everything into CN and then you have a nice sister action and everything is graded. So it kind of proves the result for the Hilbert scheme of points. But uh, it's, you leave it open. <laughs> and then what happens, in fact, um, Panripandi and Thomas proved that uh, there are examples so you can uh, sit down if you are you know serious about it and find an example of self dual obstruction theory with an almost closed function which is not closed so form which is not closed so it's not enough in some sense what this tells you is you can get such no that's please that's a very good question you can find examples, but there aren't but they aren't Hilbert schemes. So what is left open is are the Hilbert scheme or aren't they? Well, uh, one thing you can do is completely sidestep the question, and uh, there is a very important theorem of Behrendt, 
which says the following, which is constructed just working with his almost closed stuff. So he said, you know, we forget about it. I'll work with the assumption I have. And what he proves is that uh, for any X uh, complex scheme of finite type, indeed, uh, I think the correct assumption is probably complex analytic space. But uh, let, let me stay here. There exists a natural function, which I think is now called the Bering function, nu x from x to c, which is a constructible function, which means the level sets are constructible subsets. And in particular, only finitely many level sets are non-empty with the following properties. So the first property is that uh, if x is non-singular, new x is minus 1 to the dimension of x. Two, new x is uh, et al local. So it doesn't change I if you replace uh, uh, your x uh, with an et al chart. So it's analytic, complex analytic. It only depends on the formal power series, not just on the local ring, but on the formal completion. And finally, it's multiplicative in products, which means that uh, uh, the new of x uh, times y is uh, p1 pullback of new x product uh, as function. I mean, you multiply the values, p2 pullback of new y, which, by the way, fits well with this condition. <coughs> and uh, such that if x is a proper scheme, is proper, and has a self-dual obstruction theory, uh, so Remember, the, this year here was an arbitrary scheme. But now, if I assume that it's proper and it has a self-dual obstruction theory, for instance, one of these Hilbert schemes, then the integral over x of new x is the degree of the virtual class with respect to the given obstruction theory. So what do I mean by integral? Let me, uh, so the virtual class. So uh, remember we had said that if it, yeah. If you start with, so these are property of new. No, no, it's a tall local in X. It's true for any X. So this means that if I have a map Y to X, which is a tall, okay. then the function fact factors. So this is a, a local, it's just a local property. And uh, so let me say here what I mean by integral, which is something pretty obvious once you have seen it before, and uh, maybe not so obvious. So here, integral over x of new x is not an integral like an integral of differential form, but uh, this is the sum over n in z of n times the topological Euler characteristic of the locus where n, the, the value is n. So in particular, if uh, the, uh, the ma if x is non-singular, then the degree of the virtual class is minus 1 to the dimension of x times the Euler characteristic. And uh, using this uh, and some work, you can prove the result one can prove uh, at least a point-wise version of the MNOP conjecture. I told you that uh, in this paper, they relate 
uh, they say that to compute Gromov of Witten, you have to take Donaldson Thomas and get rid of the point contribution. But they also have an explicit conjecture about what the point contribution is, and you can prove that part using this formula. The virtual class depends on the obsession theory. The that is amazing, precisely. So, in particular, corollary, the degree of the virtual class does not depend on the obstruction theory. If it is self dual. No, no, that is actually something which I think to me is the most surprising thing. That uh, in general you have different obstruction theories. I mean, honestly, I don't know any case in which we have two self dual obstruction theories. So I don't know whether this is an in practice a non trivial theorem. But psychologically, it's certainly a non trivial theorem. Because it tells you that you, uh, you know, in fact, uh, after you have, I in some sense, as soon as such a uh, self dual obstruction theory exists, then this virtual degree is just a property of the, of the scheme. It's in particular, it tells you that in principle you no longer need properness. If uh, x is not proper, you can take this formula, the, this formula to be the definition of the degree of the virtual degree. It means that in the self-dual case, it makes sense to, and this is extremely useful. Typically, what happens is you take what is called what the physicists call a non-compact Calabi-Yau, so uh, something with a torus which is Calabi-Yau and has a torus action which acts uh, trivially on the canonical bundle and such that uh, the fixed locus is proper and then you can uh, do all the computation using the stratification and the point is as usual you have a virtual localization and so on but then you, you just stratify everything. It's quite quite powerful system. So I think I'm already a bit over time so I don't think I want to uh, write anything of my next uh, Thing, but I want to at least uh, say something. So where this is kind of comparatively old stuff, I would say it's uh, like um, eight years old, more or less, ten, six. So what else is more new? And this is maybe what I should have said, but I thought it's maybe better to have the background firm and then the more recent results you can ask me about uh, or it's also the, the ones I know less because I had less time to digest them. So first of all this conjecture has since been proven in uh, many important cases. I'm not up to saying always because it seems every time I don't look they find a more general version or more other case in which it should apply. So but at least in many 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 important cases. And uh, secondly, uh, in fact, it turns out that uh, all these Hilbert schemes, and in fact all calabi yau moduli spaces, are indeed uh, locally the zero locus of a closed one form. This was proven at all locally by Pantev, uh, Toen, Vakieve, Zosi, and Zariski locally by Okay, it's four names, and I remember Joyce, who's Dominic Joyce at Oxford and is the principal investigator, and the other name I remember is Bussi, because Bussi is Vittoria Bussi and is a young Italian woman, so I certainly I have talked to her because, well, Italians talk to each other. And uh, there's two more, and I apologize for not remembering. Anyway, what they, so there are these two big papers, so the Pantev Toen what do they prove and we go back to your original question. So what happens if there is an X3 and X4 and so on? Where do they fit into the picture? So in general, the general picture is that these higher X, so these higher obstruction spaces are an expression of 
higher or derived algebraic geometry. There are now several approaches, uh, some of them more concrete. There is one by Chokan Fontanini and Kapranov of the end at the turn of the century, basically. And there is a more modern version or more abstract version, depends what you think, which is due to Luri and to To and Vezzosi. And uh, then these two approaches, I'm told, are essentially the same. The, the group ar around Luri and the group <coughs> around To and have talked to each other and uh, they are doing the same thing. And um, in particular, what they do is something very general. So what you should think of is that a smooth scheme is something where the cotangent complex sits in degree zero. A scheme with uh, a perfect obstruction theory, so with an obstruction theory in degree minus one zero, is basically a manifestation in algebraic geometry of a derived object, uh, of a derived scheme which is smooth in the interval minus one zero. A smooth art in stack is again an object where the cotangent is in degree zero to plus one. And what these people do is a brave new world where the cotangent complex can go from minus infinity to plus infinity and the smooth geometrically meaningful objects have the cotangent complex which is perfect somewhere. So it's very, the going back to your question, in particular we know what we mean when we have finitely many sums. So it means uh, that it's a derived manifold in an appropriate sense. The question is, can we do fundamental classes for derived manifolds? And the answer is, as far as I know, we can't. It doesn't mean we cannot. It just means I think we don't even have a conceptual understanding while the special derived object which finish at minus 1 should have a fundamental class which you can see in the real world, in the concrete world, non-derived world where we live in. I think until we understand that, we won't know what happens in the more derived setting. So what the derived people did is they defined the notion, so they, what they did, remember the question we had before, when we had that for K3 surfaces, uh, this was actually a symplectic structure. And uh, what they do is they prove that this modular space of sheaves on Calabi-Yau manifolds you always have a duality in some degree among the acts. And this is, they prove, is called a, si a shifted symplectic structure. So symplectic structure is a map from an isomorphism between the cotangent to its dual, which has a certain symmetry. And you can see here, you have an isomorphism. This behaves like a cotangent to its dual, but it comes with a shift. And the fact uh, that it's uh, symmetric and no longer skew-symmetric has to do with the, degre with the degrees. So if you don't shift, if you shift by zero, it's skew-symmetric. If you shift by one, it's uh, symmetric. If you shift by two, it's too skew-symmetric, and so on. So what they prove is they prove in absolute generality that uh, the derived uh, stack of sheaves uh, on uh, uh, smooth projective uh, calabi uh, whatever is, has a shifted uh, uh, symplectic structure using this derived stuff. This is the analog of Mukai's theorem, is it? That's the analog of Mukai's theorem. And then what uh, Joyce and his group do is they take this huge construction and they carve out of it a humble sheath. So in particular, something you can ha hope to actually compute and you can understand even if you are not familiar with simplicial categories and A infinity categories and boost field localization in closed model categories. So he, he, they managed to read this very abstract stuff and carve out of it an actual sheaf. And they use this actual sheaf to do this uh, uh, quantization. So what they do under an additional condition of which in the moment it's unclear what uh, the, to me, what the precise meaning is. It's a condition about the existence of a square root of a line bundle. What they do is they produce a perverse sheaf of which this function nu 
is uh, in the case of the self uh, of the self dual so not just self dual but of the shifted symplectic structure uh, what they do is they produce a perverse sheaf of which the Behren function is the Euler characteristic so why is one searching for such a perverse sheaf the answer is uh, where it comes from how this is proven this comes from a circle of ideas which is uh, pre-existence, which is something having to do with micro-local analysis, vanishing cycles and so on. In particular, this function is not something he invented, it's a special, it, it's a particularly important case of uh, construction, uh, pre previous results due to Schwartz, um, I think Mireille Schwartz, because there's several Schwartzes, and uh, uh, later Macpherson, who generalized this. And uh, uh, so in some sense, everybody, once you start working there, it seems that if you know what you're talking about, which I don't, the natural thing to do when you see this is say, OK, does this come from a perverse sheaf? And the answer is, yes, it does. And this is the contribution in particular that derived the people proved uh, that whenever you have such a shifted structure, in particular in all these examples, uh, then it's locally a gradient, uh, et al locally, uh, so the zero of a gradient. And what uh, Joyce, et cetera, proof is that this is true even Zariski locally, so a much a stronger statement. And uh, finally, let me tell you what is the other big example that uh, of uh, uh, shifted symplectic structure, it's the intersection of two Lagrangians inside a symplectic manifold. Again, if you are as old as me, you remember the notion of Fukaya category and uh, all this stuff. So again, what you, it feels like is now we have enough understanding to go back to this old problem and maybe find new insights on it. But uh, this is all stuff yet to be done. Thank you.